wings. Just give us a call. I guarantee we'll find a job for you. We have a wonderful guest for you this evening. He comes to us from Tiga K, South Carolina. His name is Mr. Paul Rommel. And Paul flew during World War II. He flew the Hump, the China-India-Burma route, where he was the pilot of a C-46 commando. And later on, during the years of the Korean War, he was also an F-84 instructor. We're going to talk about all of those things in the course of tonight's program. First of all, Mr. Rommel, welcome to Carolina's Aviation Museum. Thank you very much. I understand you have a very different training story than most pilots who served in World War II. You actually trained with the RAF. How'd that happen? Well, that's true. Uh, in 1941, 42, England was being severely bombed with uh, buzz bombs, rockets, and there was no way they could train their pilots. In England, there were all operational flights uh, at the time, but no training flights. So all the English pilots, the British pilots, came to the United States for training. They had several schools. I happened to be assigned to one in Ponca City, Oklahoma. I had 99 British in my class and 15 Americans. What a prerequisite was to get into school that you had to have previous flying time, which I was fortunate to have since I sold it in 1939. Mm. Anyway, uh, we did have the 99 British and, uh, and the 15 Americans, and we graduated in July of 43. And from there, uh, we went to various training bases, and I wound up out in Reno, Nevada, which was the overseas training unit for captains to fly the hump between India and China. I finished my time there and was sent to uh, China and a uh, base Let called... Let me back up for just a second, though, because I'm really curious about this. About oh, training. I'm sorry, base in India. Well, training with the RAF, though. Right, oh, okay. W was there much difference, as far as you know, in, in how the style of training or the style of teaching between what you learned in the RAF and what you later saw in the, the Army Air Corps? Yes, there was. There was quite a bit of difference. The navigation was different. It was air plot navigation. Uh, completely 180 degrees around from uh, the type of navigation that was in the U.S. Air Force. They had different bomb sites, different guns. Instead of 30 and 50 caliber guns, they had a .303, smaller ammo, and uh, more rapid firing, things like that. Well, did that uh, harm you in any way or, or impinge on your abilities when you moved into the C-46 or any of the other airplanes? At all? Did, did it have any kind of a difference that no. you'd taken that kind of training? Not at all. Okay. Well, no. I'm sorry to interrupt you, but no, go ahead. No, that's all right. No, but you were going to fly the C-46 Commando over the hump. So, that's correct, uh, yeah. Go ahead, pick and, up your uh, story. You were based in India? Yes, and uh, myself and another fellow from my class uh, wound up over in Mizamara, which was our base in India, in the Sand Valley. And our CO was a... Um, uh, an airline pilot from United Airlines as a base commander. Most base commanders were airline pilots at that time. Mm -hmm. because, uh, and he took one look at our time and said, gee, you're my high time pilots here. Uh, and my friend Lee Zerba, he said, uh, you're my operations officer. And he looked at me and my time, which was 800 hours at the time. Most of the fellows coming in had a little over 300 hours. And he said, you're my night route check pilot. <laughs> so I wound up flying mostly at night and checking fellows out on the well, route. Let's talk about the C-46 Commando, the airplane that you flew, okay? Well, can you describe that airplane for us, what it was like, how did it handle? It was a huge airplane. It was the largest twin-engine airplane built at the time. It had a 107-foot wingspan. Empty weight, uh, it was about 30,000 pounds loaded with fuel and crew, and it was 42,000 pounds, the maximum gross weight. It was supposed to be 55,000 pounds, but most of the time they overloaded us. Mm. And we'd go off at uh, about two or 3,000 pounds overweight. Uh, the highest we could fly the hump was with that load was at about 18,000 feet. It just wouldn't go any higher with the load we had. Um, oh. And uh, to the north of us were the high hills, 22,000 feet. To the south of us were the Japanese. Mm. So we had kind of a narrow quarter to fly over to uh, China. Well, talking about the C-46 Commando, the airplane, once again, you know, I had a lot of pilots on this program and some who had flown the C-46. Some loved it, some hated it. Yes, that's true. Uh, I think I've never had a problem with it, but one of the big problems was the uh, Curtis Electric Propeller. 
most of the props, uh, like on the C-47, there are uh, hydraulic uh, actuated props. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, they had runaway props with the Curtis Electric, and unfortunately, I never did have that problem. The other problem was that as you take off, and if you weren't climbing too well, you wanted to get over the first ridge. And uh, most of the guys that throw the blowers had a two-stage blower on it so to get it to higher altitudes. And it, there's a procedure to go through to bring it back to power, putting the blower up, and then add that. And if a fellow was in severe weather of any kind, sometimes they'd uh, just throw the blower up there, which means the next guy that took off at sea level would have a blown seal and the engine would quit. Mm. But uh, it wouldn't happen in China because the, all the airports that we went to in China were 6,000 feet or so, so there wasn't the pressures that you have at sea level. Well, I think you kind of summed it up there because, again, the C-46 pilots I've spoken with, the ones I remember most who loved it said, you know, you just had to learn how to fly that airplane, that it, yes. it had its own little style, but once right. you learned it, it was a great airplane. Right, it was. Yeah, you had to go by the procedures and things like that, but it was great. It was a nice airplane. I, I, Unfortunately, had a few engine failures in it. Well, I want to talk about some of those, but we're going to talk about you flying the hump here, and I want to let our uh, our viewers know that we have a special video we want to run for you, for you that comes out of World War II, uh, narrated back in the in the 40s, that shows a uh, C-46 actually flying over the hump, and we're going to see if we can run that video for you. Then we're going to talk with Mr. Paul Rommel about his experiences in flying the hump, which means the Himalaya Mountains, right. China, India, and Burma. So uh, we're going to take a look at that video here from the 1940s. Here are the 300, 500, and 1,000 pounders that the Flying Tigers will deliver to the Japs. Everything that can be crammed inside the fuselage of a transport is flown across the hump to China. Even a primary trainer. The hump. 500 miles of the worst flying country in the world. Everything's been easy up to now. As you climb up off the field at Chapua, you can see the dead end of India, sealed off by the 16,000-foot ridges of the Himalayas. You have to top these peaks to get to China. To the north are snow-covered Tibetan peaks, rising up to 25,000 feet. To the south are the Japs. Below, barren, frozen wastes and jungle-filled valleys inhabited by headhunters. There's no summer on the hump. Snow always crowns the peaks. Ice hangs heavy in the clouds. Black monsoon storms sweep up from India, screening the peaks and bringing terrific turbulence that has flipped fully loaded transports on their backs. The worst up and down drafts in the world slide around these slopes. Jap fighters from Burma prowl the hump, looking for easy game. There is heavy toll on freight for the 14th. Casualties among transport groups flying the hump are higher than many bomb groups sustained in combat. Many a cargo destined for China is rusting on these peaks. It's a tough job delivering the goods to China. Four hours of sweating it out each way, looking for Japs if it's clear, and taking your chances with the weather if it's not. Then finally, you break out over Lake Kunming, nestling in a broad valley 6,000 feet above sea level. It's a fascinating piece of film, and uh, older, I should add, than most of the people who are bringing you this television program. It's really amazing to see that. Paul Rommel, you actually flew the hump, the Himalayas, China, India, Burma route, and that had to bring some very special problems for a pilot. And I want to discuss some of those problems and experiences with you. First of all, the weather. The weather there is unlike anywhere else in the world, from what I understand. What kind of problems did that cause for you as the pilot of a C-46? Quite a few. Quite a few, especially during the monsoon season. There were times where you wouldn't see the hump from the time you took off, raised your landing gear, and you were on weather. You'd have uh, severe heavy rain, icing conditions, and turbulence, up and down drafts were terrible. And then you wouldn't see anything else until your wheels were just about to touch down over in China. So mm -hmm. it was a lot of instrument flying. and. Uh, Again, what was the altitude you said that? that uh, well, we we would go over at eighteen thousand feet. So you had you were on oxygen at that point. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah, we were on oxygen, and and of course, 
they took all our gasoline off and uh, our bombs or uh, we took landmines, bombs, ammunition, uh, all kinds of things over, and we could come back quite uh, up 24, 25,000 feet in an empty airplane. Mm -hmm. So that was okay, and we cleared those 22,000 foot ridges on the northern route coming back. How long did the average mission or flight last? From Mizumira to Kangmeng was four and a half to five hours. Oh. And, um, and you're cruising at approximately what speed? Well, it was uh, 150 indicated, which would be probably uh, close to 200 and some uh, statute miles or an hour. Now we're talking 1943 pretty much. Navigation in aircraft has changed so much in the 60 years since then. So let's talk about the na special navigation problems you had as a pilot. <laughs> well, we, we had only one thing to navigate by, and that was an automatic direction finder. And that's all we had. Mm. And I remember just one night when things were sour, the weather was bad, the ceilings were down, I made three passes at the field and I wasn't able to see a darn thing. Uh, I called the crew up. Uh, I had the uh, co-pilot radio operators we carried at the time and said, if you fellows want to bail out of this thing, be my guest. And uh, they said, no, we'll go with you. I said, well, regardless of what happens, I'm landing. Mm. So I had everything fairly well tied down as far as the ADF approach goes, but what got me was when I got to the field, four green lights went under me. And this was baffling at the moment, and all I could think of, geez, I hope this is the right end of the airport, but there were four green lights at the other end of the field. So, and, and it worked out. I saw one white light finally go by on the left side and thought, my gosh, I'm on a runway. How did this ever happen? Mm. And well, uh, things like that. Well, you know, you mentioned the ADF, the Automatic Direction Finder, and a lot of our uh, viewers who may not be quite as aviation savvy, could you explain to them exactly how that works? Well... They had uh, non-directional beacons set on the ground in some places in the mountains, sir. But especially uh, one case I know in Yunnan Yi where the Tibetan Lion Tigers were. We took quite a bit of uh, supplies into them, their uh, ammunition, bombs, and, and gasoline, all, all of that. Uh, and these uh, non-directional beacons were set there at the airports, but you couldn't depend on them too much. Uh, one time in Yunnan Yi, we would fly up to what they call Mount Tally, which is a tall mountain to the north side of Yunnan, and you're supposed to turn in and uh, go in and land. There's an airport similar to going into Aspen, Colorado. You don't make a go around because there are hills in front of you. Mm. But, one uh, approach. Yeah, mm -hmm. and the uh, Japs thought they'd help us out, so they moved the beacon around to the back of the mountain. Ah. And I uh, caught a couple airplanes, and uh, as a reminder, when it cleared up and you could see, you could always see the tail of an airplane sticking up on Mount Tally when it didn't quite make it. But anyway, we used the uh, uh, beacons that they put on the ground, and they were uh, they were movable. Mm -hmm. uh, then Kung Ming, to keep things uh, from happening, or somebody would get out and change these beacons, they had tremendous lights like the ones they had in England for uh, picking out of the bombers coming over these lights and they put two lights out there one on each end of the runway and rather than use the beacon you could tell between these lights and they shine quite a ways through the clouds. That's amazing. Yeah. I want to remind everybody that you're watching Carolina's Aviation Museum and we come to you every week at this time thanks to our volunteers. We couldn't do it without them. If you'd like to help out at the museum or help out with a TV show, we can always use help. Just call the phone number you see on the screen or contact us through our web page, and uh, we'll find a job for you, I guarantee, no experience necessary. Our program comes to you as a part of the museum, which is an all-volunteer effort, and our museum itself is, is staged and managed by volunteers, and we hope you'll come out to the museum and uh, kick the tires of the airplanes, climb into the cockpit. It's a real hands-on museum. Be sure to bring the youngsters. They'll learn a lot about aviation history when you come out there. Our museum located right beside Charlotte Douglas International Airport, the intersection of Morris Field Road and Airport Drive. We're open six days a week, every day except Monday. And again, if you call the phone number that you'll see on the screen, you can find out the particular hours that we have. They fluctuate sometimes from season to season. Our monthly meetings are held the second Monday of every month. And you can find out where we're going to be and what your guest speaker will be if you call the phone number on the screen. And uh, 
We're talking tonight with Mr. Paul Rommel. Paul is a former C-46 pilot who flew the hump in World War II. He was also an F-84 instructor during the Korean War. We're going to talk about that, but I'm still fascinated with your stories about the hump. What was it like living at a base in India? <laughs> well, uh, it, it's about all you did is eat and sleep and fly airplanes because they kept you very busy to, to trying to get all that stuff out of India and over to China. It was a very Did you fly busy. every day? Most every day. Uh, after a couple of months, you got a, about a week's rest leave, and then you come back and fly every day again. Mm -hmm. uh, it's nothing to put in uh, two round trips. Uh, you're talking uh, uh, sometimes 16, 17, 18 hours of flying a day. But, I, oh, uh, I did want to mention that one trip into Kong Ming uh, mm -hmm. at night one time, and then uh, they do have their one, two, and three ball alerts where the Japanese Bettys come over and throw a string of bombs out every now and again. And I asked the tower going into Kong Min that night to give me a string of lights. I was on final and I wanted to land the airplane. They gave me a string and I landed. The plane behind me said the same thing. He said, give me a string of lights in perfect English. And it just happened to be a Jap Betty bomber. Oh, my gosh. And he landed a string of four bombs down the runway. One hit behind me, three hit ahead of me, but they weren't uh, to where they would curl my roll out to where I couldn't get around it. But they, and uh, during these things, uh, there, there are, like as we mentioned uh, in talking, there are sympathizers around there. The mountains around the airport were, were there were fires. So the Bettys could find the airport. They were lit, and were lit by sympathizers in that particular night. Uh, even the cook was out there with a very pistol so the Betty could spot the airport. I always liked to go over there to get food because they had fresh eggs and uh, uh, I said dog meat, but they, uh, yeah. <laughs> they had uh, some sort of uh, things they call steak. But it was better than what we had in India, which was uh, powdered eggs, powdered potatoes, and synthetic foods. Well, you were talking about sympathizers and how they would like the fires on the mountains to lead the Japanese bombers in, etc. Right. And that was your own cook, uh, an Indian or a... a uh, they Chinese. A Chinese yeah. who, who yeah. was a Japanese sympathizer. Pardon me? And he was a Japanese... Absolutely, yeah. Sympathizer. Yeah. He was. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it was. No longer. And then, short, this was on the 24th of December, Christmas Day of 1944 mm -hmm. and then the other bad day we had was in January I think 16th or 17th during the monsoon season when they had some horrendous winds up there I mean probably winds in excess of 125 or 30 miles wow. an hour and uh, our CEO said he didn't want to send us up that night but the general said send them anyway because the hump is never closed and so everybody was sent out and we got in the air. We didn't have very good luck that night. We lost some like 35 airplanes that wow. were blown up into Tibet. Others uh, had structural failure from turbulence, uh, excessive uh, turbulence and stuff like that. And this was a uh, kind of a bad night. Yeah, right there. extremely bad. Mm -hmm. uh, a few moments ago, our chief video technician Jerry Gunter had a photo up there, and you saw the thatched huts where you stayed on, right. on your base. And you had a very interesting story I'd like you to share with us about oh, yeah. the roofs of those huts and the monkeys that lived nearby. Tell us about that. They didn't, you know, those uh, huts were called bashes. bashes. And uh, there were eight, eight of us in my basha, of course, with a grass thatch roof. Mm -hmm. And we were very fortunate in having a bearer. Uh, it, my bearer was a Burmese young lad who happened to be a school teacher, one of the very few bearers that could speak English. His name was Prabhala Barua. <laughs> <laughs> I'm surprised you can say it. <laughs> I am too at this point. But anyway, he tried to keep the monkeys off the roof because they were pulling the, uh, the thatched roof apart uh -huh. and uh, hunting for bugs to eat. Oh. And of course that made a roof leak in the heavy monsoon rain. So, uh, is this a typical barracks? Uh, you can see on the monitor. Yes, yeah, that's that, that is a barracks where we live. So the monkeys would try to eat the, the bugs. Yeah, they'd the tear, tear the roof apart to get wow. to the bugs. That's what they were doing. Did you ever eat monkey meat? No. <laughs> okay. No, but I had a pet monkey. You did? Oh, absolutely. Were there, was there a lot of that 
Yes. Yeah, yeah, it was. All right, I want to move forward here. Well, before we get you away from the hump real quick, uh, what, is the, what is the one memory that you take away whenever you think of those days? When you think about flying the hump, is there one particular memory that comes to mind? Well, I've had a couple of engine failures. One of them uh, comes to mind, and I had a, well, somehow or other, I had a British uh, co-pilot with me, and I lost an engine over the first ridge, which happened to be the Naga Hills. Well, the Naga Hills is full of Naga Indians, and the Naga Indians happened to be headhunters. Mm. So anyway, when I lost the engine, I was going to go down. So in order to keep the airplane high, the crew went back and threw all the stuff all overboard mm -hmm. to make it light enough to where I could clear the hill. Again, I said to the crew, would you like to get out or you want to go with me? And they said, where are you going? I said, well, I'd rather hit a hill than jump out here because those are Naga Indians and you're going to lose your head. <laughs> down there, head on us. Wow. They said, no, we'll go with you. <laughs> so I flew around, flew around. I got into the Sawin Gorge and into Burma. And I landed at a strip in Burma. I think at the Irrawaddy River down there, pretty close to it. But I didn't know whether it was our field or a Japanese field. I had no mm. idea, but I knew I had to go there because we had pretty severe... Uh, well, before the engine, uh, I shut it down. This, uh, fellow looked at me in a very calm voice and said, I say, old chap, I believe our right engine's on fire. <laughs> very calm, calm as could be. Wanted to try and put it out. You know? mm -hmm. Anyway, we did get the engine feathered and the fire went out. And then we shut the fuel off, not everything like that. And was it an American base that you landed it at? It was an American P-38 base, frontline fighter strip. The moral of this story is, don't lose your head when you lose an engine. That's right? correct. Absolutely. That, that's well, we're going to flash forward now because we're running out of time here, Paul Rommel. And I want to talk about during the Korean War, you served in the Air Guard. Yes. And you were an instructor on the F-84. So can you tell, first of all, tell our viewers about the F-84? Well, the F-84, uh, we replaced the, our P-80s with F-84s in the Guard. When I got in, we and the P-80 was the first jet fighter. First jet fighter, right. yeah. And uh, no P-51s before that. But anyway, um, we were activated on October 10th of 1950 for the uh, Korean hassle and went to Alexandria, Louisiana, which was a World War II base and hadn't been used since World War II. But we opened it up and shaped it up and made an air base out of it, and it's still an active air base. Mm. Uh, England, uh, England Air Force Base, I believe they call it, in Alexandria, Louisiana. But uh, I had had something like 795 hours of combat time and stuff like that. Uh, so I got a squadron uh, called a replacement training squadron, and we would train pilots by taking them out and go to places like Fort Bragg, Fort Sill, Fort Drum, and put on firepower demonstrations for the troops uh, so they'd know what to call for in the way of air ground support. Mm -hmm. We would get the troops assembled on the hillside, usually the whole camp was there, and we'd strafe cars, we'd shoot two and a half inch rockets at tanks, we'd throw out napalm, and we'd throw out uh, 250 pound demolition bombs. And also, they would know when they got overseas that what they could count on mm -hmm. is for air ground support. What it would look like, what it would sound like, what it would feel like. So That's they correct. Have any surprises? Right. Let me back up a little bit, though. Here you went from flying a transport aircraft, a C-46, into flying a jet, an F-84. How was that transition for you? Lovely. <laughs> <laughs> was it difficult, though? Was yeah. it hard to make the change? No, uh, it was difficult. But the the biggest thing I found out when I first got in them. Uh, I thought it was really great, but after I flew the airplane for two or three weeks, I thought, something's wrong with this airplane. It's not like it was. And I started timing, and says, gee, it's doing the same as it always says. I guess, okay, I figured it out. The problem was, I just caught up to the airplane. Uh -huh. And I never even knew it, you know, until it was just so pronounced. We're showing the inside right now. This may bring back some memories to you. Paul. Oh, yeah, absolutely. The instrument panel of the F-84. Mm -hmm. right. Yeah, it... it uh, How did it handle? How did it handle? 
It was terribly underpowered, the first ones. The F-84Bs, the first one that come out, were terribly underpowered. Mm -hmm. uh, we had a 7,000-foot runway at Tulsa, Oklahoma, and in a hot summer day, we'd use 7,050 feet to get it off the ground. Right. So we'd say we had the world's fastest tricycle <laughs> going out of there. <laughs> The, but you uh, said by the G model it had really Yeah, improved. the later models, uh, the Bs and C Cs started to be better, and then the G model was a pretty decent airplane, and the F-84F was a good airplane. And then uh, they got into the F-105s, which they used in Vietnam, I, and uh, that took the brunt of a lot of punishment over there. I'll tell you, Paul Rommel, uh, the, the planes, just like all of us, seem to get a little bit better with age sometimes. Yes, I want to thank you, sir, so much for your service to our country, first of all, thank and for you. being our guest on Carolina's Aviation Museum. It's my pleasure. Hope to have you back sometime, maybe, thank okay? Because I know much. you have a lot more stories you want to share. <laughs> very quickly, there's something I forgot to mention at the opening of the show. Uh, we had a guest on our program recently, Mr. Bob Shanks, who is the author of The Heavenly Body. Twice he's been a guest on this program, and we're, uh, we're very sorry to announce that Mr. Shanks passed away recently, and our, our sympathies go to his family, and we thank him, certainly, for his service to our country. I want to thank all of our volunteers who made tonight's program possible. As always, our producer and our director, Brad Stafford, our chief video technician, Jerry Gunter, our audio engineer, Glenn Coggins, our video camera operator, Renee Mayer, and some other folks helping us out, Charlie Rex Road, Mike Barbie, and James Sherman. Our thanks to all of them. Also, we want to thank the fo folks here at Channel 21, because our program has been produced using the facilities of the Charlotte Mecklenburg Public Access Corporation, Access Channel 21. We couldn't do it without them, their studio, their expertise, and the fine folks that are here. So our thanks to them. I want to thank all of you for watching. Hope you'll join us again next week. Right now, i got to tell you, down with the flaps, down with the gear. Three-point landing, and we are out of here. Blue skies, everybody. <laughs>